as we come to God's word, let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is true. Sanctify us by that truth now. Open our eyes to see wonderful things in your word today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. On Palm Sunday, Jesus rides into Jerusalem on a donkey. A pony was near enough. Thank you, Teresa. He was greeted by a crowd, a great crowd, who shouted their praises. Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. The Pharisees were despairing. It seemed to them that the whole world was turning after Jesus. John tells us this in chapter 12 of his Gospel. And the second half of the Gospel of John, from chapters 12 through to 21, tells the story of the last week of Jesus' earthly life, from Palm Sunday through to Easter Day. And just five days after Palm Sunday, with the crowds and the cheering, Jesus was dead. The Jewish leaders had got their way and perverted justice to have Jesus judicially murdered. Pilate had cynically inscribed the King of the Jews on his cross. And perhaps to prepare us for this shocking reversal, the church has traditionally chosen one of the Bible's descriptions of Jesus' death to be read on the day it remembers him riding triumphantly into Jerusalem the Sunday before. Why? Oh, because Jesus' crucifixion isn't a tragic reversal of fortune. Rather, it is the very means by which he fulfills the praises directed to him on Palm Sunday. Hosanna means save. They cried Hosanna on Palm Sunday, and when Jesus dies on the cross, he is saving his people. He's saving all who will put their trust in him. He'll save you if you'll put your trust in him. Right back in chapter 1 of this Gospel, John the Baptist had pointed to Jesus and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And now he has finished that work. Hosanna is fulfilled. And who has just died on the cross? John opened his Gospel by telling us, that the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us, and he came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, they cried on Palm Sunday. They didn't know how right they were. The crucified one was none other than God in the flesh, and his death the means of grace poured out, the truth of sin and its defeated now written in God's own blood at the cross. Pilate may have been a cruel cynic in what he had inscribed above Jesus on the cross, but Jesus gave him his opportunity. You are right in saying, I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of truth listens to me. John chapter 18, verse 37. We don't have to be like Pilate and turn away. No, blessed indeed is the King of Israel, and blessed are we when we receive him as the King and take refuge in his cross. The crowds on Palm Sunday spoke more truly than they could possibly have realised. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, blessed is the King. And now the King is dead. We pick up the story on Good Friday in John 19 and verse 30. Jesus' own testimony is that it is finished. So why doesn't John just cut straight to the resurrection? Why does he dwell on the corpse of Jesus and its burial? Let's find out. First, in verses 31 to 37 of John 19, Jesus' death further fulfills scripture. This is a part two to Alex's point from the previous passage last week. The fulfilment theme continues. John wants us to dwell on the extraordinary details that God revealed centuries beforehand about the death of his son that are fulfilled quite unwittingly by the human participants in the cruel drama of the crucifixion. And as we do that, we're called to believe in the word of God. And by that, John means we are called to believe in the word made flesh, Jesus, receiving him as the one who saves and rules us. But we receive him by believing in the word of Scripture. His extraordinary truth is confirmed to us here. We cannot, in the end, separate 
those from one another. The truth is confirmed in the ancient prophecies fulfilled in minute detail in verses 36 and 37. And it's confirmed by the eyewitness testimony borne by John in verse 35. He saw what happened. He points us to the scriptures it fulfills. The man who saw it has given testimony, and his testimony is true. He knows that he tells the truth, and he testifies so that you also may believe. Just look briefly through the verses with me. Verse 31, it was Friday, the day of preparation before a special Sabbath, the second day of the Passover feast. And with typical irony, John records that in order to fulfil their religious requirements, the Jewish leaders want Pilate to torture the crucified victim still further. They ask him to inflict, from what we know from other sources, was the standard Roman practice of prurifragium in order to hasten the deaths of the victims. Religious cruelty can be the most inhumane of all. Even today there are people who believe that God is worshipped by ridiculing, persecuting or even murdering their neighbours. Whatever name of God is used, this passage shows that such behaviour is always opposed to the God of the Bible. And yet even this most hardened and hypocritical behaviour falls within God's saving plan, because when they came to Jesus, they found that he was already dead, weakened perhaps by the severe beating he received before he died, so they did not need to break his legs. Instead, to confirm death, one of the soldiers pierced his side, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. There are several medical theories which would explain this. All of them are agreed that this is evidence beyond any doubt that Jesus was really dead. From the very beginning, sceptics have questioned whether Jesus really died. Perhaps he swooned and then revived in the tomb. No. The hardened soldiers of the crucifixion squad confirmed his death and verified it by plunging a spear into him. I'd love to dwell with you on the significance of the blood and water that flowed, but we're trying to be more brief than normal. We sing its meaning in the famous hymn, Rock of Ages. Let the water and the blood from thy riven side which flowed be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. But John's emphasis is on how this death keeps God's detailed promises. Jesus is the Passover lamb whose death turns aside the wrath of God from those who shelter under his blood. Well, as for the lamb, so for the lamb of God, not one of his bones will be broken. The quote from Zechariah is even more extraordinary. In the original context, the Lord himself is pierced when his appointed shepherd is struck down. The question for us is, how will we look on the one who has been pierced? Through the eyes of hostile religion like the Jewish leaders, or through cold and unbelieving eyes like the soldiers, or through the eyes of faith that sees in the pierced one God's own answer to the cry, Hosanna, save me. Second, and briefly, verses 38 to 42, Jesus' burial reveals the heart. All four Gospels introduce Joseph of Arimathea at this point. He was a disciple, verse 38, but initially a fearful one. Jesus had warned of such half-heartedness among those who loved praise from men more than praise from God. John 12, verse 43. But these two men are a great encouragement to those who have a slow-growing faith. It takes a little time, but when the great test comes, their hearts reveal a true faith. Now they are determined to put the praise of God above the fear of man. And so Joseph and his companion Nicodemus come to honour Jesus' corpse, showing their love and loyalty to the Master in the only way they now can. They parallel the devotion of the wise men at the start of Jesus' earthly life, united in the gift of myrrh that pointed to the cross as the king's great conquest. Seventy-five pounds weight is an enormous and 
vastly expensive quantity of myrrh and aloes. Jesus may have been executed as a criminal, but he is being rightly buried as a king. Only John mentions Nicodemus. He reminds us in verse 39 that he was the one who earlier visited Jesus at night. You can read that story back in John chapter 3. You must be born again, Jesus had told him then. Nicodemus was the first one to hear the famous promise, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. John 3, 16. At the time, John didn't tell us if Nicodemus responded in faith. It seems most likely that he didn't. He went away and mulled it over. He appears again in chapter 7 to object to Jesus being treated unjustly, although he still doesn't articulate any faith. But only now is his heart revealed in this act of loving, costly and dangerous devotion to Jesus. Perhaps you've mulled for a long time over who Jesus is. It doesn't really matter how long you've taken until this point. What matters is, like Nicodemus, arriving at faith in Jesus and then putting it into practice with love. John gives us his testimony so that we might believe in Jesus and in believing, live. So put aside of the fear of men and come trust and follow him. He has come in the name of the Lord. He is the King of Israel. Only he can fulfill Hosanna. Only he can save us. And in dying for us, he has. For now it is finished, and we need only put our trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would open our eyes. Now fix them, we pray, and firmly Onto Jesus. And as we look upon the one that they pierced, grant us in him the double cure of sin and cleanse us from its guilt and power. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.